My lab is part of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, if you're not aware, NIH is sort of broken up into two halves. One half is the side that gives away money to, uh, uh, or doesn't do that as much anymore to, um, because of cuts uh, to, uh, to researchers at universities. And then a small component, about 10% of the NIH budget, is used to do research on campus in Bethesda as well as several other campuses in around the country. And uh, my lab is one of those labs. And uh, my background's actually in physics, and I don't really do much physics anymore, um, but I'm, I'm sort of, uh, think of myself as a quantitative physiologist trying to better understand uh, metabolism, human metabolism, how changing people's diets in terms of both the quantity of food that they're eating as well as the uh, types of foods that they're eating, how does that change their metabolism and, and eventually change body weight, um, the endocrine system, and uh, lead to uh, diseases or protection from diseases. So um, JD, who invited me to give this talk, uh, was really you know, insistent, given the audience, that we really have to try to bust some myths, because that's apparently what a lot of folks here like to do. And so what I'd like to start off with, and you can imagine, you know, obesity and weight loss, you know, there's hundreds and thousands of diet books out there. There's too many myths to bust, right? So I mean, it would just take too long to kind of go down the list. Um, but I thought I'd start with, you know, one which is actually, um, you know, still prevalent. You'll notice this is published in September 2014 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So this is a, you know, uh, one of the nation's best, uh, best medical journals in talking about healthy weight loss. And, and uh, basically they have this little caption here of what you need to know about weight loss. And they claim that a total of 3,500 calories equals a pound of body weight. And what that means practically is that if you decrease or increase your intake of calories by, say, 500 calories per day, uh, you will lose or gain one pound per week. And that's because 500 calories per day times seven days equals 3,500 calories. So this is, um, how many people have heard of this 3,500 calorie per pound rule? So good, maybe half, three quarters of the people here. Um, turns out to be completely wrong. Um, but this is prevalent, highly prevalent. Dietitians are tested on this idea, um, so they have to know this. And I, I first kind of came across this idea actually sitting with a dietitian in the NIH Clinical Center, and she was uh, doing some counseling of, a, of an obese subject uh, who was participating in a diet intervention. And she was looking at his food records and basically said, oh, it looks like you're drinking this much soda. If you just cut this soda out, you would lose this much weight in a year. And I was like, wow, that's amazing that you can make that kind of prediction. How, where's the, what's the basis of this? And she pointed me to this rule of thumb, which is you know, in almost every nutrition and dietetics textbook uh, that's out there. And it took me a while to figure out, you know, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, that took me on a little bit of a a goose chase that finally ended in a paper that was published in the early 1950s uh, by a guy named Max Wisnowski, who was trying to actually ask a very different question than weight loss. He was really interested in what is the, uh, how many calories are stored in a pound of human fat tissue, or you know, per unit human fat tissue. And what he does, he did some calculations about um, you know, triglyceride, that's fat, has a certain number of calories per gram associated with it, and fat tissue has a certain percentage of, of fat in it. It also has protein and water. And so he came up with this number, and it roughly was 3,500 calories per pound of human fat tissue. And the way that sort of basic science question got translated into clinical practice was the idea that, okay, well, if there's 3,500 calories in a pound of human fat tissue, then if I cut 500 calories from my diet, assuming nothing else changes in the body, then, and, and I only lose fat tissue, then after seven days, I will have lost one pound of fat. And that, that should just keep going forever. So to show you how ludicrous this is, this is the 3,500 calorie per pound rule in action over two years in a 100 kilo man. If you cut their calories by 500 calories, they would disappear. Right? So if this person was eating you know, roughly 3,000 calories per day to begin with, which is probably typical for a 100-kilo man, um, you know, after two years, they would vanish. 
right? Eating 2,500 calories a day. Something is clearly wrong with this, with this concept, right? And so I was interested to try to figure out, well, if not only is it wrong, but how do you fix it, right? Because it's one thing to just you know, show that something is a myth. It's another thing to actually replace it with something that's practical and usable and something that people can actually make better predictions of. Now, this is an example of you know, weight loss for one person. Um, this has also been used at the policy level. So this was a report by the USDA that came out in 2010 uh, where they were interested in what would happen if we taxed um, basically sodas and what would happen to obesity prevalence in the nation. As you probably are all aware, we have a, a very high prevalence of overweight and obesity in the U.S. with uh, two-thirds of people overweight or obese and one-third fully obese. And so people are really interested in how could we at the policy level as well as the individual level help tackle this and prevent or treat obesity. And so what this, um, these economists did was they went through and they figured out that if we were to impose a 20% tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, that would lead to a reduction in calorie intake um, sort of population-wide of about 40 calories per day. And then they go on to say, well then, if the average adult body weight is about 80 kilos, um, we could basically bring us back to within um, you know, 1970s pre-obesity epidemic values within five years with this sort of uh, tax. And that's, you know, that's a little too good to be true, and that's because they're applying the same 3,500 calorie per pound rule. Um, so, so can we do any better? And so, like I said, my lab at the NIH uh, started off as just a sort of computational lab, trying to figure out what do we know about human metabolism? How does changes in the food that we eat, in terms of, in particular, the macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, how do those fuels interact in the body? And if I have a, a model, I use those as inputs, because I don't know how to model why people choose what they choose to eat. But if I can bring people to the metabolic ward at the clinical center and control what they eat for extended periods of time. We've done some studies like that. Um, but if I have those as inputs and I make changes to the, both the number of calories as well as the macronutrients, that's the carbohydrate, fat, and protein content of the, of the food, how does that model adapt to those changes in foods? And in particular, how does it decide which fuels to burn? Right? So you get your energy to, to drive your, your cells um, from burning carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And how does the body and the cells choose which combination of fuels to burn? Um, and how does that then translate to changes in the composition of the body? Not just the weight, uh, weight is an interesting output of this model, but I'm also interested in changes in your lean tissue mass as well as your fat mass. After all, obesity is not just a problem with weight, it's about having too much fat. And that's the um, more clinically relevant thing. And then there's all these exchanges that take place in the body, these um, what I'm calling metabolic fluxes here. And we know a lot about the endocrine regulation of how uh, different uh, fuels are shuttled between different tissues in the body and how the diet and the, and the, um, the hormones uh, play a role in that. And then finally, how does the number of calories that the body is burning, it's the energy expenditure, how does that change when people go on diets? or change their physical activity. Both their resting calories, when they're not doing anything, they're just laying in bed, um, or their total number of calories that they're burning. So the idea back uh, when I started this program was to build this model of human metabolism using, you know, the, there's a vast quantity of data that's out there over decades and decades of careful research where people have made manipulations to diets on metabolic wards where we know what people eat, and then have made some measurements about uh, several of these outputs of the model. And um, over the years, we learned a lot about the endocrine regulation of these processes. And so the goal was to build a mechanistic mathematical model of how the body does this. I sort of thought of this when I, um, uh, by analogy, if you were to design uh, a flex fuel automobile, right, that could run on diesel, could run on ethanol, could run on regular gasoline, um, and it didn't matter what was in the tank already, right? Whatever was cheaper that day, you could just kind of fill up at the, at the gas station um, and yet perform you know, pretty optimally for at least short periods of time. That's what the human body does. 
Um, it has these three macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, and we can vary those quite a lot over short periods of time, and yet the body runs perfectly well on that. And it's a little bit more complicated because you don't have a gas tank. Okay, you're actually built out of your fuel, and you're constantly turning over um, the pieces of your body that are built out of this fuel, and so we have to regulate that process. And so we know a lot about that physiology, and so I went ahead and built this model. Here it is. Um, so I thought for the rest of the talk, I'd just walk through equation by equation. Now you're not, <laughs> you're probably not interested in that. If you are, you can read these two papers in the American Journal of Physiology. What you're more interested probably in is once you've built this model, how do you know it's any good? How do you know it makes real predictions? Well, the way you do that is you do this model validation exercise. And then you compare predictions of the model with data from completely independent experiments that weren't used in any way to build the model. Um, and you're only allowed to change the initial conditions of the model. In other <coughs> words, if you're going to try to simulate an experiment in a lean young man, you're allowed to start the model off with the body weight, composition, resting metabolic rate of a lean young man, and then you feed the model with whatever was fed in that experiment, and you make comparisons with the data. Okay? Um, and similarly, you can, if you're now doing a, another validation experiment with a, an obese woman, you can start the model off uh, with the right body composition and the right um, a metabolic rate of an obese woman and feed them in that study. But you're not allowed to fiddle with any other parameters. Okay, that's the, that's the sort of game you play. And we've done this now with dozens of, of experiments with men and women, lean, obese, overfeeding experiments, underfeeding experiments, experiments where you swap out carbohydrate and fat. And you can read more about those in these two uh, publications. But I thought I'd share a couple of examples that aren't in these publications that, are, that we've uh, uh, done more recently. One is a very old study. It was conducted by Benedict um, near the turn of the 20th century um, on a single individual. And this was a time in history which is kind of interesting. Uh, there were uh, a proliferation of people called hunger artists. Has anyone heard of this kind of thing? So this is a, it's, it was for entertainment's sake. People would starve themselves for periods of time. Um, not for their entertainment, but for other people's entertainment, and they would make money doing this. It was a profession. Um, I guess television was pretty bad back, in, <laughs> back then. Um, so, so this was one person who uh, was from Malta and came to Boston to Benedict's laboratory because of two things. One, Benedict wanted to understand the physiology that was going on when these people were starving themselves. And number two, this person wanted to have the longest documented fast of, uh, that, that was yet uh, occurred, and so he wanted to fast completely for 31 days, with the exception of water. He's allowed to drink water. And so what we did in this uh, particular validation experiment was we started off the model with this, per this person's initial weight and, and height and, um, and, and sex and, and uh, some estimates about his body composition, because we didn't have that information back then. Um, he was about 60 kilos, so not a very big guy. And, um, and for the first couple days, he was allowed to eat, but they measured what he ate. And so we actually fed the model with what he ate for those two days. And then he ate nothing um, for the next 31 days. And so the dots here are the data. The curve here is the model prediction. Okay, so not bad. I mean, it might lose a little bit more weight than it should over the first uh, little week or so, but otherwise pretty good, okay? Um, Underneath the hood of this, it's not just a body weight model. It's also predicting something about what's going on in terms of the physiology. And so what I'm plotting here are the breakdown rates of, this, of basically the endogenous or the, the body's fuel sources. Okay, So lipolysis is the uh, term for the breakdown of fat from the body and the release into the circulation. Okay, And so when these, this person started fasting at day zero, the rate of breakdown of fat from this person went up sort of plateaued after about a week and then kind of stayed there, maybe started to slowly go down. Um, glycogen is the body storage form of carbohydrate. Okay? And you can see that that, upon the induction of fasting, is going down. It's not going up. right? So it's basically depleting <coughs> the glycogen that was there. And the protein, um, which you, know, you don't really have a storage form of protein, but the body does use muscle proteins and breaks them down and uses those as fuel. And you can see that that's more or less flat over this period of time. So this is the rate of supply of fuels from storage uh, pools in the body 
And then the energy burning cells then look to see what's available and it has to make a choice about which mixture of fuels to burn. And the model makes some predictions about that. And that's what's called oxidation. So we have carbohydrate oxidation crashes, <coughs> fat and ketone oxidation goes up and then sort of reaches the, the majority and protein oxidation gets suppressed a little bit. Okay? Now, um, we don't have measurements of these things directly, but what we do, what we can do is we know a lot about the chemical stoichiometry of carbohydrate, fat, and protein oxidation. We know exactly how many oxygen molecules um, get consumed and how many CO2 molecules get produced when we burn these different fuels. And so what we can do is we can make predictions about, in total, given these oxidation rates, how much oxygen was consumed and how much CO2 was produced. And uh, the ratio of those two things is something called the respiratory quotient. And that was something that Benedict did measure. And so all you need to know about the respiratory quotient is that if it's 1, it means you're burning all carbohydrates. And if it's 0.7, it means you're burning all fats. Okay, so we have measurements of this in this person over the course of this 31-day fast. And again, the dots here are the data, and the curve is the model prediction. And so what you can see is that the model is correctly predicting both the time course and the magnitude of the shift from a primarily carbohydrate burning person to a primarily fat burning person over the course of this fat, fast. And we're not fiddling with parameters here. We just start the model off and fast it and see what it does. Similarly, you can see how many total calories these people are, this person is burning as well as uh, how much at rest. And so, um, you know, it might not do so great over the first couple days of uh, resting, but more or less matching the, uh, the rate of decrease in calories. So that's something kind of interesting, right? This notion that, according to that 3,500 calorie per pound rule, that nothing happens in the body when you cut calories, well, clearly something does, right? Your metabolism slows down. And that's going to be a common theme that we'll talk a little bit more about. And this is just one example of that. And then finally, we can look at other things like how much uh, ketones were excreted in the urine and compare that with the, with the uh, data, um, as well as how much nitrogen was excreted um, and, and look at the comparison. So again, uh, the idea here that I'm trying to get, to, uh, get across is that the model's, number one, behaving reasonably, and number two, it's actually modeling the detailed physiology underneath these metabolic adaptations that are taking place. So here's another example of a, of a validation experiment that we conducted. This was a study by Rudy Leibel, uh, Jules Hirsch and Michael Rosenbaum back in the, uh, the mid-90s, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was not a uh, fasting person. This was a, a group of obese um, subjects who stayed for nine straight months on their metabolic ward. So not, they didn't go home. They fed them all their food. In fact, they didn't feed them any food. They only fed them liquid diets, okay, because then you can really titrate exactly how much they're eating. So these people, these obese people, spent um, nine months drinking only these liquid diets, which Michael Rosenbaum tells me tastes like cardboard, basically. Um, <laughs> and the idea of this experiment was to give them 800 calories a day until they lose 10% of their body weight. And then you ramp them back up on the same liquid calories until you balance their body weight for a period of a, a couple weeks. Okay? And then you do the whole thing over again until they lose 20% of their body weight and ramp up the calories again and maintain that new body weight. So we started off our model with the average obese subject in this uh, experiment and fed them this energy intake. And this is what we get. Again, the curves are the model predictions and the boxes or triangles are the data points. And what you can see is that the total energy expenditure, that's the total number of calories that are being burned, drops very quickly. It starts its descent downwards. Okay, so they're really suppressing how many calories they're burning. A lot of that's coming from how many calories they're burning just at rest, okay? And some of it's coming from the physical activity calories. And then when they're ramping up at the same weight, you can see that there's a difference between the dynamic part when they're losing weight and then when they're weight stable, right? So there's that bump up in the number of calories that they're burning even though they're weight stable. So it matters whether or not you're in active weight loss or maintaining a stable body weight, even though the weight at that point, uh, those time points is equal. You can see that they uh, actually measured that in the resting metabolic rate. At the very end here um, of the active weight loss uh, phase, that is suppressed more than when they uh, are 
maintaining that same body weight. So these metabolic adaptations are taking place, and the model accounts for those. Um, how about the body weight changes? So here's the, again, the weight changes, how much is coming from fat mass and fat-free mass or lean tissue mass over the course of this uh, nine-month um, experiment. So you can see that the weight changes that we're predicting are pretty close to what was actually measured, as well as the composition of that weight change, the fat mass and the fat-free mass. Incidentally, if we'd used the 3,500 calorie per pound rule to predict what these folks would have weighed, I think uh, we would have been off by about 80 pounds at the end. Okay, So not a good predictor of, of what happens to people's body weight when you change their calories. Okay, so here's um, an example, another sort of extreme example, uh, that uh, my lab actually did some measurements with, uh, along with a collaborator, Eric Ravison, at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. And I was, you know, I came home from the lab one, uh, one night and I watched uh, the tail end of this program called The Biggest Loser. How many people know about this program? So pretty much everybody. You may not have watched it, but... Uh, <laughs> And uh, I wasn't a regular watcher, and so when I went home, I saw these people stepping on scales and hearing, oh, you lost 15 pounds this week. You lost, you know, 20 pounds this week. I'm like, how is that possible? It's just, from everything I know about weight loss, it just doesn't make any sense that you could lose weight that quickly. Um, and so I basically contacted the physician who was in charge of the care of these folks, and I asked him, Look, wh wh how many calories are these people burning? Because I saw... You know, in the next episode, them on treadmills and getting yelled at. Um, but I didn't really answer the question that I had was, how many calories are they burning? How many calories are they eating? What's happening to their metabolism? How much of their weight loss is coming from fat versus lean tissue? And he didn't have answers to any of those questions, except for the, the body composition, because he was actually making really nice measurements of body composition using the same uh, methods that we use at the NIH. But he didn't know how many calories they were burning. He didn't know... Um, how much of their uh, metabolism was slow, slowing down. He didn't know um, about, uh, about, the, uh, uh, about how much they were eating. And so uh, I sent one of my postdocs, and Eric Ravison sent one of his postdocs to this ranch in Malibu where they were doing this, this, uh, this show. And this was the winter of season eight, the season that we studied. And in seven months, this person lost 239 pounds. Um, that's a rate of weight loss that's much quicker and much more than you would get with those, uh, those bariatric surgeries you may have heard about for extreme uh, obesity. So I was just really curious, what's going on with the metabolism of these people? And does our model, even in these extreme conditions, actually do a reasonable job of simulating those metabolic changes? So basically, here's the average data. So this is uh, the mass change uh, on average uh, for the folks over the duration of this seven-month period. Um, for the first 13 weeks or so, people are spending time on the ranch. We're getting these weekly body weights. Um, again, the same sort of pattern here. Uh, the boxes are the data. The curves are the model simulations. Um, while they're on this ranch, the average rate of weight loss is one pound a day. Okay? So one of the answers of the week is that a TV week is not a calendar week. So uh, that was one thing. But a pound a day on average, that's an impressive rate of weight loss. Um, and then basically what happens is that after, after they leave this ranch, they go home with instructions to keep it up. Right? They go back to their regular life. And the idea is, OK, you can keep up this sort of weight loss. We're going to bring you all back to Los Angeles at the end for this big finale and make all these other measurements. And uh, it's part of a competition, and so there's some incentive to actually do this. Um, so people go home, and their rate of weight loss slows, but it slows by a half. So they're still losing half a pound a day on average. Okay? So it's just an incredible clip of weight loss. The other thing that you might notice here is that the vast majority of that weight loss is coming from fat mass. Right? Only a little bit is coming from sort of lean tissue mass. And that's, that's actually really important. Um, and it's better this way. The, the greater the weight loss that comes from fat versus lean, the, the better in terms of uh, uh, kind of function of the body. So, um, and the model is predicting that. Why, why did that happen? Well, we also measured how many total calories they were burning. We used a, a, a fancy technique with uh, two isotopes of water and looking at the rates of elimination in the urine. We actually dosed them with these two isotopes 
at baseline before they knew that they were actually contestants on the show. We knew that they were contestants. They didn't know. Uh, each dose of this water costs about $1,000, so we didn't want to be wasting <laughs> a lot of this uh, dose. And so at baseline, they're burning about 3,700 calories a day. Okay, this is without exercise. This is just these folks uh, doing their day-to-day -day life. Um, and then six weeks into the program, we dosed them again, and their total number of calories that are burning went up by about 1,000 calories a day. And then when they came back at the, at the very finale, uh, they're down you know, around 2,500 calories a day or so. So um, how much was exercise? Well, to get that curve, our model had to simulate a pretty dramatic increase in exercise. So this is just the calories consumed during the exercise. Um, getting upwards of almost 2,000 calories a day towards the end of this time on, their, on the ranch. Um, that's, that's the average, and that actually works out to about three hours of vigorous exercise every day, seven days a week. Okay? And that actually corresponds to what they do on the ranch when they're observed. Okay? Um, now, uh, you'll notice it drops off a lot when they go home. But uh, something that you probably don't know about exercise is that uh, the energy cost of exercise depends on both the intensity and duration of the exercise as well as how much you weigh. Okay? So doing the same intensity and duration of exercise after you've lost 50 or 60 kilos costs you much less energy. It's not really fair, right? If, especially if you're trying to continue to lose weight, but it's true. So even though that that number is now only about you know, 400 to 500 calories per day, that still works out for these folks after they've lost so much weight to be about one hour every day of vigorous exercise. Okay? So it's not nothing. It looks like it drops off a lot, and it does. It drops off by you know, two thirds, but it's not nothing. What I thought was really interesting was how many uh, calories they were burning at rest and how that changed over time. So let's, uh, and we'll talk about the myth in a second, but the fact was that these folks' resting energy expenditure, the resting metabolic rate, fell by 800 calories a day by the end. Okay? That's a huge drop, right? That's a large meal. Um, and it was actually, if you then, a resting metabolic rate is also dependent on your body weight. Okay? If you correct for how much weight and how much fat and how much lean tissue they lost, um, that's still 500 calories a day more than you would expect based on those changes. Okay? So this is what we call metabolic adaptation. That's the greater than expected slowing of metabolism um, relative to the weight change. Okay? Um, and the model has that physiology captured in there and it's doing a reasonably good job of capturing that. Now, one of the myths that uh, you may have heard about if you've ever read a fitness magazine is that if you're doing exercise and you're actually able to keep your, you know, preserve your lean tissue during weight loss, then you'll keep your metabolism from falling. Well, that clearly did not happen, right? So these folks did do the exercise. They did preserve their lean tissue compared to what they would do had they lost the weight by another means without exercise but the resting metabolic rate still fell dramatically. And so we can kind of rule out that as a, uh, as a, um, as a fact or it's, it's really fiction. So one of the things that we then did was we asked the question, um, how much would these folks have to be eating in order to lose weight at this clip if they were doing this kind of exercise? And what we came up with was that while they were on this ranch, they were eating an average of about 30, 1,300 calories a day Remember, they're at the end burning just in exercise about 2,000. Um, and then that goes up to about 1,900 calories a day when they go home. So this is not a sustainable program, right? This is not something that these folks could do forever. They would waste away. They would do something like that 3,500 cal. They would die. They could not sustain this. But, um, but it explains that rapid clip of weight loss and, and what, they were, uh, what we observed. Um, we can ask some questions now that we have this model. We, can, we don't know the answers if this is really what happens, but it's interesting. So what if they had only done the, the, the cut in calories in their diet and their exercises stayed at zero? Versus what if they'd only done the exercise and kept their calories at that high level? So we can run those two simulations and ask, you know, how much weight would they lose? How much would come from fat? How much would come from lean tissue? And here's what 
we get from that simulation is that the diet alone would lead to more weight loss, but less fat loss. And in fact, with the exercise alone, they would lose more fat than they would lose weight. So they would actually increase their lean mass a little bit, despite the fact that they're in this huge degree of calorie imbalance. They're not eating as much as uh, their body is burning. Um, so that's an interesting concept, and it's, this, it's behind the first part of that myth, right? If you do the exercise, you're able to preserve your, your lean tissue mass, but your fat mass is going down a lot. Um, and then in this case, you'll notice that about, you know, two-thirds or so is coming from fat mass, but a third, or about 30 percent, a little bit more than 30 percent, is coming from lean tissue mass loss. So that's quite a bit, right? That's a, a good chunk of lean tissue that's being lost over the course of this. Now, do we know anything of any other way to lose a similar amount of weight and see if this kind of prediction of how much comes from fat versus lean is true? Well, we do. We know about this uh, surgery, surgery procedure called Ruan Y gastric bypass. People lose about as much weight in a year as the biggest loser folks lose in seven months. And so what we did was we uh, collected a group of 13 biggest loser subjects and matched them up with 13 bariatric surgery subjects and said, OK, well, what was the percentage of weight change? And the weight change was the same coming from lean versus fat, fat-free mass versus fat mass. And you can see that you know, we're way below 20% um, in the biggest loser case, but the gastric bypass case is, is indeed about a third of their weight loss is coming from fat-free mass. And they're not doing a lot of exercise. So the idea is that this is, in some sense, validating that prediction of what happens with diet alone versus diet plus exercise. OK. So one of the things that we did was uh, built a, a simplified model as opposed to all of those detailed metabolic fluxes and changes in fuel metabolism. And um, in 2011, we published that, that, that model in The Lancet. And along with it, we published this little um, applet, Java applet, called the Body Weight Simulator. It was written by an undergraduate uh, math student in my lab. We didn't really expect this to be you know, very popular, but it turns out that um, you know, now close to 2 million unique users have used this uh, little applet. And the idea is on the left, you enter in your baseline information about your current weight, your height, your sex, um, and answer a couple questions about your physical activity at work and at leisure time. And uh, it gives you an estimate of how many calories a day uh, you're currently eating and burning to kind of maintain that weight. Then over here, you go over and say, OK, my goal is to weigh a certain amount in a certain number of days. And what the, this calculator will do then is it will calculate how much you have to change your diet and your, and your physical activity or exercise in order to reach that goal. And then perhaps even more importantly, what you have to do permanently after you reach your goal to kind of maintain that weight loss over time. Um, and so, so, yeah, so this has been a pretty kind of crazy successful <laughs> part of, of what we put out there. And right now, we're working with the USDA to make a much more user-friendly version. And it will be kind of coupled with their nutrition database to, to kind of make that um, uh, more, uh, more user-friendly and more useful for people. Um, this has also been incorporated in some mobile apps. Uh, so this was one, if you just look up BW Simulator, there's a free app that was written by my colleague Carson Chow, uh, very bare bones. Uh, version, and then there's another one by uh, the Tactio Health Group who implemented this in their, in their program, and that you can then track your weight along with your predictions and that sort of thing. And as far as I know, they're the only ones out there that are using our model um, to kind of make these sorts of predictions. Everybody else uses the 3,500 calorie per pound rule, um, so you will be sorely mistaken if your uh, weight does not follow what you would expect using those apps. OK, so what about, I've talked to you about you know, this, this uh, um, research use. I've talked to you about uh, some examples of very extreme cases. Uh, when we published this paper back in 2011, a uh, weight loss physician in Cedar Rapids contacted me and said, you know, I've got this weight loss program. I've got these people who are really super adherent to this program, and they're losing lots of weight. And you know, I'm just wondering, in this practical, real-world clinical situation, does your model 
do a reasonable job of predicting the weight change and what can we learn about this. And so he sent me some, some of his data from his subjects. And here's two of his subjects. Um, and what the, again, the, the dots here are the data points. And the solid line is the best estimate for an individual. And the dashed lines are just some confidence intervals. Given that we don't really know how many calories they were burning to start off with, we don't really know how they've changed their physical activity over the course of this, um, of, of this intervention. So this is two of the subjects clearly doing what you would expect based on the simulations. If you look at all 60 plus subjects, and I plot the weight change versus uh, the, the modeled weight change versus the, uh, the data, you can see that these all fall very close to the dashed line of identity, which would be a perfect prediction. Um, the, they're highly correlated with each other. And I've actually labeled these in two different ways. One is the solid dots, and the other is the open boxes. It turns out that the open boxes were outside that weight loss range, okay? And most of them fell on the less weight loss than would be expected based on our model. Um, and then several people were within the expected weight loss range. And so even in this group of super adherent subjects, at least according to the, the clinician, there were people who were falling outside the expected amount of weight loss. And so this, and he is now using this, this model um, to say a couple things. There's three reasons they could fall outside that weight loss range, and they're all clinically important. One is that they're not actually as adherent as they should be. Okay, so that's probably the most obvious one. Uh, they say that they're eating only the diet that they're eating, but they're actually cheating a little bit. Another reason is because the model's wrong, right? The model has uh, not the, the changes in metabolism that were built on this research basis and work for the majority of these adherent subjects actually don't work for these people. And that's clinically important because it means that their metabolism is somehow abnormal and responding differently than, um, than normally. And so that's also clinically important. And then the third reason it could not work is because they're changing their physical activity in ways that are not predicted by the model. They might be actually slowing down. So they're on this diet. They're adhering to the diet. Their metabolism is slowing exactly as you'd expect. <laughs> But then they're also not moving around as much, right? And so that's another reason, also clinically important. And so we're really excited about using these kinds of tools clinically to kind of help physicians and patients manage weight loss programs. Um, coming back to some uh, myths, or what I what I think is, you know, there's this title, the fundamental flaw in obesity research, and I kind of alluded to it a second ago. Um, and then a more recent paper that came out uh, where they basically claim that making energy balance measurements is actually worse than nothing. And what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the fact that when you're not in a, on a metabolic ward, we have no good way of understanding what people eat. When I first learned this, because you know, I'm still relatively new to this field, that was just mind-blowing, right? Um, the fact that we don't have a good way, or at least an inexpensive way, of measuring what people eat, right? Despite, despite like the proliferation of apps and things like that. So for most studies use some sort of self-reported uh, way of <coughs> calculating what people eat. So here's a diet record. So people actually you know, weighing and measuring out exactly what they eat. Um, or another method is called the food frequency questionnaire. You go through some extended period of time, say the past two weeks, how many times did you eat apples? How many times did you have a hamburger? How many times, what was the portion size? These are all methods that have been used for decades in nutrition research. And what's been shown, again, using that, that, that doubly labeled water method, those two <coughs> isotopes that measure how many calories people burn, well, if you total up all of these calories and you actually measure what they were burning, there's a huge offset. There's a bias. Now, the bias is in the direction you'd expect. People report eating much less than they actually eat. Uh, obese people report proportionately more of a discrepancy. Uh, and those data early on led to a lot of the um, ideas that obese people were hypometabolic. They didn't burn as many calories, because if you add it up, how many calories they were eating, it was always this really low number. Um, and I don't know why that is. Some of them might just be outright lying. I don't necessarily think that's the case. 
Um, it's an interesting question. But the problem remains, how do we measure what people eat when we um, can't just ask them or can't just let them do these detailed reports? Um, so there's some new technologies on the horizon that are trying to kind of get at that. Um, Edward Sazanov at the University of Alabama is constructing these devices that count how many times you chew and swallow, uh, as well as little cameras that kind of take pictures and uh, take pictures of the food before and after you eat them. Um, there's also these little uh, wrist-mounted sensors that are actually little gyroscopes that are tuned to detect bites that you count. So there's all sorts of of new things on the horizon that are really being tackled to try to, or they're trying to tackle this fundamental flaw in, in nutrition research. But how would you know if any of them worked? How could you validate them, right? Well, the one way that you can validate them is by looking at this gold standard. And this is, this is something called the energy balance equation. It basically says energy intake, the calories that you eat, is equal to the energy expended, the calories you burn, plus any changes in energy stores in your body okay, over some period of time. So these are rates, calories per day, calories per day, calories per day. And so you can measure these things. Again, that was this doubly labeled water, which is a $1,000 glass of water that I told you about. Um, you can do some sophisticated uh, uh, body composition assessments. Again, pretty expensive. And to get an idea of this over time, you've got to do this repeatedly. So this is extraordinarily expensive, but this is how you would have to validate any new method for measuring what people eat. Um, so, and there's actually not a lot of data sets where this has been done. Um, so our, post, our, our idea was, look, we've got this model that when we know what people eat in the research setting, um, and we have this model that does a pretty good job of predicting how many calories they're burning, how that changes, what their body weight and body composition is going to do. So why don't we take that same model and just ask the inverse question? If we measure what people eat, uh, have, not, if we measure what they weigh and how that changes, could we predict how they've changed their calories in their diet? Okay, that's the idea. And let's compare that to a case where we actually have that gold standard information. So. Here's a, a given individual who participated in this uh, study called Calorie, um, which is this comprehensive two-year study um, with repeated doubly labeled water and DEXA measurements, so these uh, very expensive measurements. Um, I don't even want to consider how expensive this was to, to do, um, but they did these repeated measurements at these different times um, in 140 subjects over a two-year period where they were intentionally imposing calorie restriction. It was a really an aging study. Can you maybe have heard of, of some theories about calorie restricting, protecting, and, and extending life? That this, that's what the study was about. But fortunately, they had these weight trajectories, and they had these very detailed measurements about what happens to the number of calories they're, um, they're, they're actually eating. And so here's one example of one person from that study. This is kind of, kind of what the data look like for this individual. This person cut, you know, on average, this is uh, the mean and the confidence interval, uh, a little less than 600 calories out of their diet to begin with. And then that sort of went back up to about 300 calories and 250 calories or so. Using just the body weight data, this is what our model predicted. Okay, so not too bad. This is one of the better examples, okay? Um, but if I look at all 140 subjects, this is what their weight change curve looked like. And if for every individual subject, I just plugged into our model their weight change and asked how much did they change their calorie intake and use this very expensive method to compare it to, this is what you get. So we have different numbers of subjects at different periods because there was data missing from different periods. But you can see that the model is very close to this doubly labeled water DEXA method. It's within 40 calories of the mean in every case. Um, so we're really excited about this new methodology because not only can you use this retrospectively like we did here where people have collected body weight data and they want to figure out how much people ate, we can do this prospectively, right? We can track people's body weights as they're losing weight and figure out how they've changed their diet. Maybe that can give them some inf information about um, you know, what to do in the future and what they have been doing in the past. Um, so for example, this is the time course of a typical weight loss program. 
outpatient weight loss program. And not super adherent subjects like that uh, other example I showed you, but in typical subjects. Uh, this is uh, data from Stan Heschka's group in New York. But practically every outpatient weight loss clinic can show you data that look very much like this. And what happens is people lose weight for about six to eight months, and then they plateau, and then they slowly regain. And if you use the self-report methods, or, um, or you just sort of read how investigators have interpreted what's causing this, this sort of weight pattern and the regain, um, they'll tell you that what's happening is that you cut people's calories initially, and uh, they lose weight, but their metabolism is slowing down. And that's true, right? I showed you those curves before in that data that shows that that's true. And then they say that by that six to eight month time frame, their metabolism has slowed down to match the number of calories that they're eating. Okay? And so now they're still on this diet, but they're not losing any more weight. So they don't feel the incentive to stay on the diet, and so they slowly lose adherence. That's the, the, the story that's typically told to explain this weight trajectory. So what we can ask is, well, does that match up with what our model says, right? We can do that same method that I just showed you, plug in this curve and ask, what is the changes in calories that would have to be taking place in order to give this change? And the answer is it gives a very different picture. This is the prediction of the model. It says that there's basically an exponential decay of diet adherence. So people are really good initially at cutting their calories, but then they basically lose adherence quite relatively quickly. And if you actually then plot that alongside the, the weight, you'll see that there's this sort of disconnect in time, right? So that even at the point where this person has lost their maximum, that's their point of maximum success, they've, they're, they're almost all the way back up to where they started in terms of their adherence to the diet. And there was this long period of time where they were slowly increasing how much they were eating and still losing weight, giving the wrong message, right? <laughs> it's like you can cheat a little bit more and more, whether that's conscious or unconscious, and still lose weight. So that by that sort of nadir, they'd lost 80% of their adherence to the diet. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know if this is true or not. This is what our model suggests is happening. And so we're doing a study now at the NIH to actually validate this using the same sort of doubly labeled water DEXA method in obese people in weight loss programs. Um, we can also ask another question about, okay, well, you know, the, the weight loss is, is good and they sort of plateau. And if they just stayed down, that would be great. What would it have taken in just to keep them down, right, instead of regaining? So we can ask that question. It's kind of interesting. There's not a lot of permanent change that has to take place in order to maintain weight loss. It works out to about 10 calories per day per pound of permanent weight loss. So if you want to lose 10 pounds, get there and then keep 100 calories a day lower than you were before, or add 100 calories of exercise, right? And so this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, use of our models, I think, is, is going to provide some um, interesting insights that we can then test uh, in uh, using more expensive but uh, sophisticated methods. Uh, the last example I wanted to share was trying to explain uh, the changes in calories that would be associated with um, the average weight gain of adults in the U.S. since the 1970s. So this is the obesity epidemic. There's been about a 10 kilo or 22 pound uh, increase in the average adult body weight. And what could possibly have caused this, right? Um, well, we can ask the question of, just to get this trajectory, what would people have had to have been eating on average? And this is the answer that our model gives us. It says that we've increased the average number of calories eaten by about 250 calories a day. Um, across the entire population. So why have I plotted it on this scale? Well, I plotted it on this scale because this is what the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says was in the U.S. food supply per capita. Okay? So a couple things. One is this huge offset, right? And the other thing is that the slope is more steep. Right? It's been increasing faster. Well, not all of the food that's in the food supply gets eaten, right? Some of it gets spoiled or you know, lost along the way. And the USDA does a correction 
um, called the loss adjusted food availability. So after you correct for spoilage and, and, uh, and non-food uses of, of uh, things in the food supply, you get a curve that looks quite similar in shape, but is at least bringing it down to the 1970s levels that our model predicts, but the rate of increase is still too high. Um, so we can ask the question, what if we'd actually eaten what the USDA thinks we'd eaten, right? So plug the model in the forward direction, and, and this is what the simulated body weight, average adult body weight would be. So, you know, close to, you know, a little bit more than 200 pounds on average, um, compared to what the, na um, the National Health and Nutrition uh, Survey, uh, examination survey says, right? So where did these missing calories go? So it's kind of like... We can't account for them. Well, one way to think about the difference between these curves is that you, that's a prediction of how much food might be wasted, right? So or at least it was available in the food supply. It was lost somewhere along the line. Um, so we can plot that difference. And we can compare it to what the USDA said was lost. So again, matching the numbers in the 1970s, but progressively um, worse in more recent years. And so I actually went to the USDA, talked to uh, the person in charge of putting out these estimates, and I showed her what this looked like. And I said, you know, why is it that we agree pretty well in the 1970s, but we're suggesting that you're about, you know, 25% too low in more recent years? And she basically said, well, you know, I, I, I wish we had more funding to kind of do this more accurately, but the last time we had a lot of funding to do this was in the 1970s to kind of figure out how much food of each kind of commodity was lost at different points in the food supply chain. And we've used those same loss estimates, you know, ever since. Um, but you all know that the food supply has changed, or in the food environment has changed quite substantially since the 1970s. Um, but she said, you know, why don't you go talk to the folks at the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, because they actually measure food waste in landfills because they're interested in what's going into landfills and how do we manage that. Um, and so they actually publish data about municipal solid food waste in landfills. Um, they don't publish it per capita, so I just changed it to per capita. And both of these scales are tripling, so you can compare the slopes. So there's been a parallel uh, increase in food waste in municipal landfills. Uh, it's 50% increase since the 1970s. So, what does that mean? <laughs> I think it's really interesting. Um, it turns out, and we, we document this in this paper, that about 40% of the food that's produced in this, or uh, imported minus exported, the food that's available in the country is not eaten. 40%. Um, it, it turns out that to, just to produce the food that doesn't get eaten, we use about a quarter of the freshwater consumption. So a total of the, uh, the quarter of the total freshwater consumption in the U.S. just on the farm goes to produce food that doesn't get eaten. Um, if we were to bring back per capita food waste back to 1970s levels and somehow make that food available to be eaten, uh, not eliminate it, just bring it to 1970s levels, we could fully feed 60 million people. So, I mean, these are not small numbers, right? Um, and then there's all of the, the greenhouse emissions and all of this other stuff that you can think about. I think we worked out just on the farm, um, this would be about 300 million barrels of oil a year just to produce the food that doesn't get eaten, just on the farm before you start transporting it. That's about equivalent to all of the offshore drilling combined. So it's a huge, it's a huge number. Um, so, so we actually came up with what we call the push hypothesis for the US obesity epidemic as a result of looking at these numbers. And it's a hypothesis. And the hypothesis goes something like this. We've had uh, a lot of changes in agriculture. Uh, in particular, lots of really good research has made agriculture very efficient. We've changed the subsidies and the policy structure, which has really uh, increased production of food. Uh, in particular, corn and soy. We're really good at growing corn and soy. We're really good at fi figuring out how to feed livestock these grains that they normally wouldn't eat if you give them the right set of antibiotics. That's driven the cost of food down quite dramatically um, over this time period. Um, 
So it's you know basically cut the the uh, the cost of food in half per calorie. And I think the most interesting thing is that of that increased food that was in the food supply, only a third went to generate obesity, and two thirds went in the trash. <laughs> So this is what we call the push hypothesis for the U.S. obesity epidemic. And I don't know at the NIH if I can do anything about that. But what I can do something about is better understand what happens to the people who do become obese and maybe even try to understand why some people were more susceptible to these changes in the food environment. So part of the lab is now working with folks at the Mental Health Institute to do neuroimaging of, of uh, people, both lean and obese people, better understand how they respond to um, tasting food, uh, how they respond to pictures of food, food advertisements, those sorts of things. Um, but I don't have time to talk about that today. And I just wanted to end uh, with uh, answering the, some of the questions that I posed at the beginning, which are what would the real weight loss of 500 calories a day look like compared to the 3,500 calorie per pound rule? So that's the answer. So it's that same obese man. Doesn't lose, doesn't disappear after two years, right? Loses, you know, quite a bit of weight, but is, you know, basically normal weight at the end, okay? If they were able to cut 500 calories and maintain it, they'd lose about 50 pounds, okay, 25 kilos. So, by the way, this is kind of, again, this is the sort of the 3,500 calorie per pound rule predicts that nothing happens to energy expenditure. That's the big flaw. Um, whereas the dynamic model says energy expenditure slows down and eventually matches intake. But it takes a long time. It takes about three years to get 95% of the way there. Um, what about soda taxes? Well, the USDA folks actually collaborated with us afterwards once they realized their mistake. And we published a, an economics paper in 2011 where we revised their predictions. So soda tax would not reverse obesity to levels of the uh, 1970s, but um, would do something. Um, you know, it wouldn't, it, it's not nothing. It does reduce the prevalence of overweight and obesity. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Thanks for my long list of collaborators and students and postdocs along the way.